In our everyday lives, we like to think of our world as vast and expansive, brimming with diverse landscapes, bustling cities, and a seemingly endless array of human experiences. However, when we take a step back and contemplate the size of our planet in comparison to the rest of the solar system and the universe around us, we begin to realize just how small our world truly is in comparison. Compared to the rest of the planets in our solar system, the Earth may be larger than the other rocky inner planets, but it is dwarfed by Jupiter, Saturn, and the other gas giants. Yet even giant Jupiter is small compared to our Sun. The Sun accounts for 99.8% of all of the mass of our solar system. The Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, the rest of the planets, all of the moons, asteroids, comets, and other assorted debris of our solar system account for just 0.2% of the total mass. The Sun is, literally and figuratively, the center of our solar system, and of life as we know it. The Sun is a gigantic ball of plasma, hot, glowing ionized hydrogen, helium, and traces of other elements. It is so enormous that you could fit more than one million Earths inside it. It is a gigantic fireball, so hot and bright that even being 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers from us, it gives us enough light to see and enough heat to keep water a liquid. Like an onion, the Sun has different layers. It has a core deep in the center, where all of the energy of the Sun is being converted from hydrogen fusing into helium. Next is the radiative zone, a thick soup of hot gas where the photons created in the core can take 50 million years to pass through, being absorbed and emitted over and over and over by the dense material. The convection zone has hot gas near the tachocline, the transition from the radiative zone, and cooler gas near the surface. Cooler gas sinks down toward the core, and hot gas rises up toward the surface creating giant convection cells that churn energy from the inside of the sun out into space. This movement creates the granulation we see in the photosphere, which is not really the sun's surface, but the layer where most of the visible light of the sun is emitted, where the photons escape the interior and fly out into space. We can see this granulation with a full-spectrum telescope and a white light filter. Above the photosphere, we have the chromosphere, a region where the light from excited hydrogen is prevalent, but is much dimmer than the light from the photosphere. This is a deep red color that we need special telescopes to see, ones that block out all light but a very narrow band of a very specific wavelength of red light. From the chromosphere outward is the corona, a superheated region of fast charged particles that we can only see with specialized satellites in space or during a total solar eclipse on the Earth. Looking at the surface of the sun with a telescope, we can see sunspots. These dark regions of the sun, first observed around 1610 CE, are planet-sized regions of strong magnetic fields on the solar surface. They often spawn eruptive disturbances such as solar flares and coronal mass ejections. These regions of the Sun appear darker because they are cooler than their surroundings due to the effects of the strong magnetic fields in the area. The central dark region, the Umbra, is about 4,900 to 7,600 degrees Fahrenheit or 2,700 to 4,200 degrees Celsius whereas the surrounding photosphere is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or 5,500 degrees Celsius. They are still quite hot, but appear dark only due to the brightness of the surrounding photosphere. On the morning of Saturday, June 24th, 2023, I was able to image the sun in hydrogen alpha light through a dedicated telescope and monochromatic astronomical camera. I was able to record for a period of about three hours, gathering nearly two terabytes of data and processing it to create this time lapse of our sun. Each frame is a minute of time, with some events going on during the entire duration of the recording, while others transient, lasting just a few minutes. While the sun can be observed with an eyepiece through this telescope, many of these flares, prominences, spicules, and other events would have been almost unobserved to someone just looking through the eyepiece in real time. The events taking hours would change almost imperceptibly during human attention spans, while the faster events would be difficult to catch across the face of a giant sun full of details. It is for this reason that long-term observations and time-lapse video have become important tools in understanding our sun and unlocking its secrets. Prominences like these, streams of plasma riding looped magnetic fields bursting from the sun's interior, can rise a hundred thousand miles or more above the photosphere. Even the smallest of them easily dwarf the Earth. Sometimes the plasma can hang like a cloud for a time over the surface, seeming to defy the intense gravity of the sun. The magnetic field lines can also pull bits of plasma up and along before bringing them down again to the chromosphere.
plasma rain can be seen falling back to the surface, while a sunspot spits a flare out into space. Prominences and drifting filaments on the surface of the Sun look dark, being a little cooler than the rest of the chromosphere. Filaments near one sunspot move, and a little while later, another sunspot throws a filament flux rope into space. Along the northern horizon, wild jets of material called spickles send tendrils of plasma 6,000 miles or 9,000 kilometers high at 60 miles per second before collapsing back down again. The filaments in this sunspot group, called 3340, show significant change over three hours. The granulation and fire-like appearance of the chromosphere is quite evident as well. The largest sunspot of the group can almost swallow the Earth. Sunspots are numbered by appearance in the current solar cycle, so 3353 is a small latecomer in this trio of sunspot groups, and even seems to disappear when covered in filaments. Let's compare it to NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory can see from space. The Solar Dynamics Observatory, or SDO, was launched on February 11th, 2010, and its goal is to understand the influence of the Sun on the Earth and near-Earth space by studying the solar atmosphere on small scales of space and time and in many wavelengths simultaneously on an almost continuous basis. Thirteen years later, it is still gathering data daily and making discoveries. The SDO has two primary instrument groups, with its atmospheric imaging assembly instruments imaging 10 different wavelengths of light, and the helioseismic and magnetic imager instrument focusing on the movement and magnetic properties of the sun's surface, providing three additional images. A third instrument group, the Extreme Ultraviolet Variability Experiment, measures the sun's extreme ultraviolet irradiance with improvements over any previous spaceborne solar observatories. The helioseismic and magnetic imager instrument creates a white light image that shows the sun roughly as it appears dimmed enough to see sunspots. The HMI can also create a dopplergram to show which bits are moving toward us and which ones away. The HMI's magnetogram shows maps of the magnetic field on the sun's surface, with black showing magnetic field lines pointing away from Earth and white showing magnetic field lines coming toward Earth. 193 angstroms is emitted by iron-12 at 1 million kelvins and iron-24 at 20 million kelvins. The former represents a slightly hotter region of the corona, and the latter represents the much hotter material of a solar flare. This wavelength is typically colorized in light brown. 304 angstroms is emitted by helium-2 at around 50,000 kelvins. This light is emitted from the chromosphere and transition region. SDO images of this wavelength are typically colorized in red. 171 angstroms is emitted by iron-9 at around 600,000 kelvins. This wavelength shows the quiet corona and coronal loops and is typically colored in gold. 211 angstroms is emitted by iron-14 at temperatures of 2 million kelvins. These images show hotter, magnetically active regions in the sun's corona and are typically colorized in purple. 131 angstroms is emitted by iron-20 and iron-23 at temperatures greater than 10 million kelvin, representing the material in flares. These images are typically colorized in teal. 335 angstroms is emitted by iron-16 at temperatures of 2,500,000 kelvins. These images also show hotter magnetically active regions in the corona and are typically colorized in blue. 94 angstroms is emitted by iron-18 at temperatures of 6 million kelvins. Temperatures like this represent regions of the corona during a solar flare. They're typically colorized in green. 
1600 angstroms is emitted by carbon-4 between 5000 and 10,000 kelvins. Carbon-4 at these temperatures is present in what's called the transition region between the chromosphere and the corona. Images here are typically colorized in dark grainy yellow. 1700 angstroms is the ultraviolet light continuum, showing the surface of the sun as well as the chromosphere. It is typically colorized in a grainy pink. If you found this video informative and educational, please support our efforts by liking and subscribing below so we can continue to produce content like this.